Please welcome to the stage, Cowboy Ventures founder and managing partner, Aileen Lee, and Sequoia Capital partner, Alfred Lin, with Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. You guys have known each other for a long time. Yep, we have. And you've been in the industry for a long time. That's right. And we're not going to like belabor the point. You're calling but you're us old. You're, you're, you're three cycle <laughs> investors. That's right. That's what they call us. You're three, three cycle, cycle investors. investors. So you've been in tech through the through the dot com bust, through the recession, and through whatever this thing is that we're in now. The downturn. Where are we? What is this? Where are we in the cycle? You want to start? No, you can start. I, I mean, I think we're in a downturn, and we're still going down. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've got a while to go. It's going to be pretty bumpy for a while longer. Alfred, how bad does it get, and how long does it last? I don't know if it's, I, I'm not a macro economist. But most of the people here aren't. I'm not going to predict how long or how bad, but it's always a good time to start a company if you have a great idea. So yeah. I wouldn't just just focus on the negatives. I'd focus on all the innovation that's happening. There's always a tug of war in Silicon Valley between creative innovation and some constraints that is happening. Right now, the constraint is much higher interest rates and much higher cost of capital. But there's a ton of innovation happening. Absolutely. And so I would focus on that. So in 2008, Sequoia said, RIP, good times. 2020 was Black Swan. 2022 was adapting to endure, a little fancier. <laughs> adapting to endure, that is fancy. <laughs> what would you, you say today? Up? What's 2023? I would say it's a tug of war between creative innovation and, and the constraints that, uh, that we face. And I think founders don't start companies because of the, the, any cycle. It, whether it's a downturn or an upturn, you start a company because you have a great idea. And so there's a tug of war going on, and your job is to figure out how to creatively find solutions to both. Cost of capital being higher is, yeah, that could be, you can think of it as a problem, or you can think of it as an opportunity. And the things that worked for the last 15 years because interest rates was close to zero, that's out the window. You have to find a new set of playbooks. That's right. If you had a slogan, what would it be? If I, so I, was, I was thinking about this because I had a feeling you were going to ask about <laughs> it. And so I was thinking, OK, um, it could be the age of deathicorns. Mm -hmm. This is coming from the unicorn lady. Um, Aileen coined the term unicorn as it um, pertains I, to tech And maybe companies. we'll talk about this a little bit. But I By think, the obviously, there are a lot of companies that raised a lot of money at very high valuations that will probably not stay there if and when they have to reprice. Um, and then I was like, oh, this is too sad, a little too morbid. And then I was thinking. <laughs> It's maybe the age of Ozempic, <laughs> right? Which is like companies have to kind of put themselves on a diet, right? And like, what, if, you, if you don't know what Ozempic is, it's this diet drug that helps you eat less, right? And so it like kind of reduces your appetite. And so I think we've been living in this age, we lived in this age of chasing growth where capital was free, so you could spend a lot of money. Speed and growth is more important than focus or discipline. Uh, and now everyone has to focus. They have to probably do less, chase less, focus more. And the constraints will create a lot of creativity. And it's like people kind of, I guess, like people who, are, who have taken Ozempic say, like, I was really surprised that I don't need to eat as much as I was to be healthy. I think a lot of companies will do, le like do more with less and become healthier. Um, but I, didn't, I think actually the thing I thought of last was, Maybe it's a return to ramen. Oh, we're getting ramen really creative. Yeah, 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 exactly. And that's what I, I brought you each a little, <laughs> little present, just, you know, to oh, usher cool. in the age of ramen. Eat okay. This now? I yeah. prefer ramen to Ozempic. You do? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if you haven't heard this, so I think Paul Graham popularized this uh, term, ramen profitability, right? Which is like get your company to a place where you're making enough that you can actually pay, like kind of pay the living, pay for the living expenses of the founders. Um, pay attention to margins, pay attention to, to team quality, customer obsession, and how much money you're spending. And I think that's probably what we're, we're getting back to. I want to talk a little bit about the term unicorn because I've heard some people say, we shouldn't even be trying to be unicorns, and that messed everything up. How do you respond to that? 
Like all these people I don't, I trying mean, to be, the whole, all these companies trying to be a billion dollar company. That was when like a really weird, like twisted perversion of the idea, yeah. right? The whole like, original idea was like, it's hard to build a billion dollar company. Because, you know, five or 10 years ago, to build a billion dollar company, you had to generate $200 million in revenue or $300 million in revenue, right? So that means you have to be really smart about what you're building, about your revenue quality, about your team execution. Um, and it was just about also just how hard it is and how rare it is. So. I think we're probably going back to that as well. It's a special thing. I actually, PitchBook says roughly one third of VC backed unicorns, and there are more than 400 of them, haven't raised money since 2021. What's in store for them, Alfred? I think a lot of companies raise a lot of money in 2021, and so they're going on their diet. They're, they're trying to figure out how to have as much of a runway as possible. and. They're trying to build and grow into their valuation. I think the issue with the term unicorn is not the term, it's the fact that people were chasing a vanity metric, which is valuation, as opposed to just core fundamental financial metrics. Like going back to basics, as, as Aileen was talking about. Um, we had Brian Chesky at our first base camp and he told the audience um, at Sequoia, of Sequoia founders, you know, we, you, people used to call us a unicorn, but really now feels like a unicorn when we have a billion dollars in revenue. And then we, he, we had him back in this, this past year uh, at our recent base camp, and he's generating a billion dollars a quarter in cash flow. Mm, that's so awesome. that's, that's called a real unicorn, yeah. in my opinion. That's a real business. That's a real business. How is the volatility changing the way Sequoia is investing? Volatility? What volatility? The broader economy. <laughs> We don't measure things on it. The, the best part about the private business, it doesn't affect volatility. We don't watch the public markets day to day and see how, whether it swings up or down. And the best part about investing for the long run is you're focused on enduring companies. You look, you're focused on category defining companies that can last for a long, long period of time. And I go back to what, you know, we're gonna probably talk about AI, but think about what Jensen did when he started NVIDIA. It wasn't even about AI, it was about graphic, you know, a, gra a, C a GPU, it's about graphics. It was about processing and calculating things in a different way. He was solving a very hard problem because floating point uh, computing was what the CPU did really well and he wanted to multiply something called matrices. And now we're using that for AI. But accelerated computing took a long time to develop. He's been at it for 30 years. And that started with a seed investment from Sequoia of a million dollars. Uh, we over time invested about four million, less than $4 million into this company when we, and went public and we distributed it when it was a 20X. Uh, imagine if we had the Sequoia Capital Fund back then because I think the current holdings, if we held it to, to today, it would be worth $58 billion. Not bad, that's a unicorn. Yeah. It's a unicorn. Well, it's what about Cowboy? I mean, I, I think, um, it's funny, before I went into venture, I worked in the fashion business. I worked at Gap, and they seem like they're very different businesses, but you and I both know this, right? Like, yeah. We both work in fashion. Yeah, we both worked in fashion <laughs> businesses, right? It's like, things, trends, like they come and go. And you know, we, there are cycles in economies, there are cycles in business. We're in a tech cycle where I think we've, people bought a lot of best of breed. There was an app for everything in the past five years. We are kind of moving into back into a consolidation cycle where C CFOs, CIOs, CISOs are saying, hey, we have too many SaaS vendors. We need to kind of whittle the number of vendors that we have. Not everyone can bring their app and expense it. Um, so the bar, at least because we invest in a lot of enterprise software, um, I think the bar is a lot higher right now to be able to sell a new enterprise software package to the enterprise. But I think the reason why people will buy new software in the future is AI. Um, it's going to drive a whole new generation of applications that are going to be AI native, and it's going to deliver completely different benefits uh, than older software. So that's pretty exciting. And I th it's going to be, a, like, valuations are lower, teams are going to be more disciplined. Uh, so I do think, just like after the Great Recession, some really incredible companies are going to be built in the next couple of years. There was quite a big unicorn that recently became a deathicorn. Alfred, you are a big investor in FTX, Sequoia was a big investor in FTX. So much has been made of the cult of personality of Sam and how many smart people were duped. I don't know how you would describe it, but lessons learned? 
there? It's only yesteryear. Oh, no, 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 no. But I think, you know, some key learnings. I think I learned a really hard lesson, but I learned that I have really great partners. Um, we talk about Sequoia, that's a Sequoia investment. It's not my investment or someone else's investment. And I really felt supported during that time from all of my partners. I also just looked at the, we looked at the work that we did 15 different ways. We um, probably would have made the investment again. So mm. the lesson learned there is one that's really hard to take, which is we're in the venture business and there are going to be losses. And while it stings to lose $150 million from our global growth fund, it's two to three percent of that fund. Mm -hmm. And our our LPs pay us to take calculated risk. And we're gonna lose sometimes. There are companies that are gonna surprise us to the upside, like Airbnb and DoorDash and NVIDIA and Google, and then there are gonna be companies that are not going to do very well. And we have to be comfortable with that. And that is actually the most uncomfortable feeling, where you look at the data, you would have done it again, and yet at the same time, you have to be okay with it. Aileen, What's your take on, I mean, the, 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 the sort of the cult I mean, of the founder? Alfred and his, his colleagues are incredible investors. I mean, they're really the best in the business. So um, it's almost, it, it's almost um, reassuring that they, they're not, like, they don't bat a thousand, because it seems like they bat a thousand. <laughs> we the, don't. The reality is nobody bats a thousand in this business. You know, if you're lucky, you're batting 300 or 400, right? It's about slugging percentage and a lot of, like, you know not really about, about like, you know, <laughs> I know a little <laughs> more about softball, but um, it happens, you know, and these very, like a very high integrity person, so it happens. The thing that um, I would even say it's even worse than batting 300, it's you're going to lose money 10 to 50% at a time, depending on the scale of the business. Yeah. Yeah. In the venture business, you're likely to lose money 30 to 50% of the time. In the growth business, 10 to 20% of the time. It is painful to realize those losses. But yeah. we are, in, the tr we are in, in sense, a trust business. We have to trust the founders and what they tell us. Because if we don't trust them, then we're not going to invest in the company. And sometimes our trust will be misplaced. Are, is Sequoia still committed to crypto? Yeah, we're still very excited about the concepts of crypto because the idea of creating trust where trust didn't exist before is very appealing. Now, are we fans of certain things that happened during the boom? No. But it, this is a sort of area where it happens, you go from place to place to place, and there's a reason why things are inflated, because it's just something interesting in that space. Mm -hmm. You have to separate the noise from the signal, and you have to find the interesting companies. Going back to, you know, calling us three cycle investors, <laughs> the internet index dropped by 90%. Yeah between 1999 and 2001. That doesn't mean that there weren't great companies that came out of the internet. And in fact, the internet is bigger today than it was in 2001. But you had to be aware that you're gonna take some lumps and losses, and you hopefully pick some good ones. Yeah, I think yeah. the thing that's hard is obviously during downturns, people lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. um, people are forced to move out of tech. Um, people's money are, like, are lost, not just institutional investors. And I think that's really hard and something we would love to avoid. So a topic that's not so yesteryear is Sequoia's restructuring. You are parting ways with Sequoia China, India, Southeast Asia. Untangle this for us and yeah. the motivations. Parting ways. So it's actually five business units. There's a US Europe business that is Sequoia Capital, the private business. There's the what we call the heritage business that is for our um, for uh, our founders and our partners, um, and also some select endowments. There is our hedge fund business, which is SUGE. There is our India South East Asia business, and then there's also our China business. And we've those five businesses have always been independently owned and operated. I don't actually have any influence on the decision making in any of the other four mm -hmm. business lines. That's always been the case. The only difference now is we're, we don't share the back office anymore. And that's partly because there was a fair amount of brand confusion, and we think that it would be better if all five of these businesses were seen as separate entities. Mm. And our LPs, we have, um, and our customers, our LPs and our founders, 
couldn't be happier. Aileen, what's your take on this? You know, seeing, you know, obviously there's been, firms have changed. So far, Cowboy firms India and Cowboy China are all staying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's I, I don't know what to say about that. Well, I, I do want to have one more question about the China thing, because, um, you know, a lot has been made about Sequoia's lobbying in, in, in D.C. and what has come to be called your China problem. Did, what did the geopolitics have to do with it? Geopolitics was not the primary driver. It was one, it's a factor, um, mm -hmm. but it wasn't the primary driver because if it was just China, then we would just do that with China. We have five separate businesses now. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I don't think the, that was ever going to be a primary reason because the primary reason is how we best serve our, our limited partners and our founders. So let's talk about then where you are doubling down and focusing, I don't know if it's necessarily more on the early stage, right? But that was sort of my interpretation of what was said about where your part of the firm's focus is going to be now. We're, gonna be, we're, we're still focused, as always, on idea to IPO and beyond, helping founders, daring founders do start at the seed and invest in them from idea to IPO and beyond. That's always been the mission. Yeah. Aileen, as someone who's been, I mean, you've been in seed since the beginning, right? Well, Cowboy, I started out doing, yeah, at Cowboy, yes. Right. I mean, I think, and I don't want to say going back to your roots, but, you know, we are seeing this trend of, of firms changing and especially in the economy, mm -hmm. making different decisions. Yeah. Is that, what, is, is this going to define the next decade of venture investing? So, uh, I mean, we, we were debating this a little bit before because I think, I think it's Bill Gurley who said that your fund size is your strategy. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think large multi-stage firms, it doesn't really make sense and it doesn't serve founders the best for them to, to do much seed investing. Or they should be really clear with the founders, like, look, we're partially doing seed investing because we want to make sure we have a shot at the A or a shot at the B or the shot at the C, but we're, we're a really big fund. We have to deliver giant returns. And we kind of have to titrate our time on the companies that are, that are more, that are kind of more de-risked to be able to deliver us the return. So we are happy to co-invest with multi-stage firms at Seed, but I do, I'm a, a fan of like kind of stage focus at Seed. Companies are very raw. We often invest pre-product. And so our team is kind of built to be able to take on that kind of a risk and assess those folks and, and like kind of do all the heavy lifting and then hopefully graduate them to great series A and B investors. But I think a lot of multi, maybe not you all, um, you all are kind of unicorns in your own right, but a lot of multi-stage <laughs> firms are going to pull back from the seed business because I don't think it makes sense for them. All right, so let's talk about AI. We've been talking about it all day long. Sam Altman obviously was here this morning. Is AI the next big thing or the next big bubble? The next bubble, is that what you said? Well, it's both. <laughs> How much is hype? How much is reality? Are we in the new spin cycle? Or is this going to be real, truly defining technology? I think I, I, I don't like the term. I would say this. I don't like the term artificial intelligence. Ooh. I like the term AI to mean augmented intelligence. Mm -hmm. We've been investing in augmenting our intelligence for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the trend of that, and how technology has augmented our productivity. Mm -hmm. That has happened for much longer than either of us have been investors. So let's take that perspective. I think what people are talking about right now is an innovation in AI called large language models. And is that real or not? I think that's real. I think we've talked about companies before large language models and what they need to do after large language models. And we see companies that are adopting large language models from the seed stage to uh, growth stage to public companies. Brian Chesky was here with you talking about their problems that they're trying to solve with large language models and they want to do a matching. They want to do better matching, not better search. Um, and the, the, there are just many, many problems and ideas that can be uh, solved for small companies, for large companies, and for innovators that are going to create companies in the space. So, I think it's a real trend. Uh, now, that doesn't really answer your question or whether it's a bubble or not. It could be both, as Eileen just said, which is, 
know, there's going to be a lot of hype around some of these things. But back to the internet bubble, you can have a situation where the index loses 90%, and yet there are great companies that come out of it. Mm -hmm, yeah. like, are at the seeds day, are, are startups going to survive uh, or succeed in the age of AI? You know, there's a lot of talk that like, right, the incumbents yeah. already have so much power. They do have a lot of, I mean, it takes a lot of compute resources, yeah. and that's why we're seeing, it's kind of a tale of two cities right now, I think not just at seed, but at probably every stage, that a lot of the companies that are AI native um, and also have teams that are pedigreed. My joke is like, you know, th three guys who, who interned at OpenAI last summer raised a $50 million seed round. <laughs> like, people who have some credibility in the space are raising very large rounds at pretty high valuations. A lot of other software companies are struggling to raise. Um, I think there's gonna be a lot of great companies built, both that are not kind of with these pedigreed AI founders and um, uh, without. But yeah, there's definitely, that space is commanding pretty premium valuations right now. Now, obviously Aileen, you have personally been such a champion of, of diversity in the industry, or the co-founders of, of All Rays. And I'm curious if, in the midst of all of this volatility, and this great economic- With a ally. Ally, sponsor. ally. Partner, yep. Ally, thank you. Um, restructuring, are you worried that some of the progress that we've made on diversity is going to take a back seat or that we are going to regress? Well, we definitely have to be wary. Uh, when you look at past downturns, uh, I think our industry is doing a really good job of building more sensitivity, trying to take bias out of, uh, um, out of processes, starting to track and measure the diversity and the composition of their cultures and teams. And so they've made changes in the past couple years. And so we cannot go back to w the way it was. Um, I think more founders realize that they have a lot of influence on who they hire and a lot of VCs on who's on the board, who's on the management team, who's on the cap table. And as long as we continue to push for that and be committed to it, I think we can continue to make progress in our industry, but we cannot let up. Yeah. Um, there was a UN study that just came out this week that showed that like nine out of 10 people in the world are biased against women. It's like, that's pretty bad. Um, I think a quarter of the people surveyed said it's okay to beat your wife. Like, there's a lot of stuff we can fix. And the tech industry is so influential um, and so consequential that I think we have an incredible role to play. All right, so we've heard your taglines, tug of war, take Ozempic, eat ramen. No. <laughs> <laughs> Last quick question, how far out is the next era of good times? Oh, how far out, it's good times now. <laughs> this is fun, guys. <laughs> you get to solve hard problems. Yes. Let me just tell you that if you don't want to solve hard problems, you should get out of business in general. And you, that's just true because if you want to build an enduring company, you will face hard times at some point in your career. If you want a long career in business, if you want to build an enduring company, just focus on solving hard, valuable problems and be patient. Let's keep the good times rolling. That's a great ending. <laughs> All right, Aileen Lee, Alfred Lin, thank you. thank you both so much. Thanks for having us.